It is April 25, 2016, and we're in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let us start with prayer. Heavenly Family, thank you so much. You have really given us a beautiful feast so far and a beautiful day, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you would have us understand this evening. Please help us to grasp the principles of truth and to be bound together in love, both with you and with each other. Thank you so much. Please guide us. Bring this meeting about to be just what it needs to be. Help all of us to consider the principles not as theories, but to consider them in such a way that we apply them to our own lives and live them out. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Let your righteousness reign. We ask these things, Shem Samach. Amen. And Heavenly Family, also, I just want to ask for those who are traveling, and even if they're just driving home, that you would keep them safe and guide them. And for those who are in pain tonight, uh, with headaches and muscle cramping and all kinds of whatever other aches and pains, back pain. Heavenly Family, there's a lot of us who need your healing touch, and we just ask that um, angels will be sent to comfort each one and that pain might be alleviated so that we can all gain the most uh, blessing out of this meeting tonight. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Okay, so, um, of course, we're still studying the community rule here, and it'll be good for us to just get right into it where we left off. Um, so we are looking at, let's see, we're at 1QS, column uh, 2, lines about 19 to 25 or 26. I'll read this paragraph again to keep it fresh in our minds, and then we can move on to certain aspects uh, that we haven't discussed yet within it. Okay, so here's the paragraph. Thus shall they do year by year for as long as the dominion of Belial endures. The priests shall enter first, ranked one after another according to the perfection of their spirit. Then the Levites, and thirdly, all the people, one after another, in their thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, that every Israelite may know his place in the community of God, according to the everlasting design. No man shall move down from his place, nor move up from his allotted position, for according to the holy design, they shall all of them be in a community of truth, and virtuous humility, of loving kindness and good intent one towards the other. And they shall all of them be sons of the everlasting company. Okay, so that's the paragraph. We have already discussed essentially the first half of it. And so the next part is going to, it basically deals with the idea of people not changing their appointed place and everyone being humble, and so on and so forth. Um, so does anyone have any comments or questions concerning the paragraph as a whole, or concerning the uh, latter parts of it, which we haven't discussed yet? Why would they want to change their place? That's a good question. That is a good question. Any thoughts? Well, I'm just thinking about the principle, and I remember uh, during the night of the Last Supper, Sister White says that, you know, before the washing, all the disciples were just, you know, thinking about it and, and even talking about what position they were going to occupy in the kingdom, and that was uh, foremost in their minds. And, and she said that's one of the reasons that Christ 
you know, that, that he needed to really do something just to shake them out of that thinking. And so that's that's the fleshly thinking, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And if you remember back to um, what we're told about Lucifer and how he decided that he wasn't satisfied with his position, he wanted to be equal with God. He wanted to be taken in to the council that was being had in relation to creating this world and and um, or the inhabitants of it or however exactly it came to be, but um, he wasn't satisfied with his position. He wanted to move up. But, you know, there's also, I was noticing this last night, how it says that no man shall move down from his place nor move up from his allotted position. And most of the time, we... It, it, well, it's more common to just simply think of someone wanting to move up in position. They're not satisfied with where they are. They want more prestige or whatever. But there's also the, uh, the flip side to that, someone not wanting uh, their, the responsibility that they may have and not wanting... Um, to kind of have these obligations or whatever the case may be. I mean, I'm trying to think of different reasons why a person might want to move down from their position. Maybe they just even, you know, just kind of thinking self-depreciating thoughts or whatever, but... Yeah, self-depreciation, laziness, um just simply pleasure seeking yeah pleasure seeking or um distaste for the particular position you know and they might just say well i I'd, I'd rather have something you know even lower than do this uh-huh. you know that sort of attitude is a, a way that someone might want to move down and then of course moving up you know just as people have already said you know, pride, self-seeking, and, of course, self-exaltation and being along with those. And, um, you know, power over others, potentially, that sort of thing. Someone might also want to move down because they value the society of someone further down more than they value their God-given duty. Um, That's what I was thinking. A friend or something they wanted to be closer to. Sure, that's certainly a possibility. I mean, this is slightly different, but Adam moves Ah. down from uh, a pure and perfect state to a impure and imperfect state just because, you know, he wanted to be with Eve. So that's that's just another example of why someone might want to move down. But I guess there's probably many, many others beyond what probably what we're thinking at the present time. And maybe others here still have other examples. Maybe wanting to be closer to the Master. Are we talking about only men here, or is it men and women? If that's the case, it could be a, a somebody, a woman and men. Right. Well, um, in the community rules, so far as we're aware, there's nothing that, um, you know, makes it exclusive to men or anything like that. But as far as I understood your question as to why would someone want to move, you know, change their position, uh, I was kind of understanding that a little bit more broadly just for the principle of it, whether it's specifically in the community rule or in heaven or, you know, some other system. I woke up this morning with the thought, thinking about that, that the only way you can have 
peace or two can walk together, they've got to be agreed. So if, if we don't become one with our Creator, we can't go to heaven because we've got to be one with Him. If, we, if we're one with this world and its system, you know, we'll be one with it and be destroyed. But the only way you can have peace is you've got to all believe be on one mind. You know, obey everything mm-hmm. that's there. That, that God values that, that keeps heaven heaven. Right. So, are there any other thoughts on this whole idea of, you know, moving up, moving down, that whole thing? I, I think sometimes we uh, <laughs> value our own judgment more than... Uh, and, and maybe you know maybe more than the uh more than the master <laughs> and uh, maybe we feel there's somebody more qualified than us you know somebody that we saw doing a lot of work or whatever and for whatever reason the master has them in a a position that we think that maybe uh they would be better at than us or whatever and the other thing is it's only a one year thing so i believe it's only a one year thing right so it gets reshuffled every year that's how I understand it as well, yeah. Um, but that's an interesting point about thinking someone else might be more qualified or the flip side of that is someone could think that they're more qualified than someone else. But, um, yeah, that's totally something, you know, Ellen White talks about that idea of people wanting to just leave the responsibility to someone else because they think that that other person is more qualified. And that... Does anyone know where the mistake is in that thinking? Well, the, the master, I would think, knows more background. I mean, there's there could be issues in their life that, you know, that let's say it's my wife and I, I think my wife is more qualified, but, you know, the master may know of something going on that I'm not familiar with. Maybe inspiration shared it with, with the master or whatever, you know, that, that maybe disqualifies them from that position. Mm-hmm. The thought that comes to my mind in response to your question as to what's wrong with that type of thinking is that to look at someone and think, oh, I, I can't do this because I wouldn't do as good a job as this other person and then leave it to someone else to do is, hey, we can all improve in our skills and if there's something that we're not uh, as qualified as we could be, then rather than just give up and not do anything, we should strive to be better. Okay. There's also, we wonder why they're so strict, but there's only one way of having unity. If everybody's doing their own thing, you can't, it's got to be, one set of rule, rules, you know. That's why it's so strict because there's no other way of having peace than, you know, you gotta, you need rules. No other way of having heaven. It's got to be God, God's way because He knows what makes for love, joy, and peace and unity. We can be one with the devil, doing things His way, but we won't have love and joy and peace. And we'll have unity, but that's all. That's why the one world government, you know, they want to make, make, bring peace to our world, but the only way they can do that is to force everybody to do things their way, but, but it's not God's way. So the thoughts expressed in terms of why the type of thinking is wrong that says someone else is more qualified to do a job, you know, those thoughts expressed in relation to that are certainly true. Those are all different factors as to why that thinking is wrong. Um, There's something else that connects with those, um, but it's kind of a different nuance. Does anyone here remember the text that we sent out for this last daily? Uh, 
I don't remember it word for word, but I'm waiting to see if someone else pulls it up or something. But uh, God, I can cheat. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go ahead. I really liked it. The work which God gives us to do, He is able to accomplish by us. And it's Amen. LT twenty seven through or LT twenty seven page one one thousand eight hundred and sixty one. I don't know what LT twenty seven is. Yeah, that's actually um letter and then the last four digits are the year. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, I know it's a different Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a different system uh with these letters and everything now. Uh but yeah, that's that's basically how it works. But you know, and that statement kind of says the principle: how, hey, look, the work that God gives us to do, He is able to accomplish it through us. So who does the accomplishing? God, our heavenly family. Yeah, our heavenly family. They're the ones who are able. Someone else who we might think more qualified, they of themselves are just as unqualified as any of us. You know, all of us are equally unqualified of ourselves. The only way that someone can be qualified to do a work that heaven gives them is if they allow heaven to work through them. It really takes humility, and that's basically it, just willing humility. So if someone else can be enabled by heaven to accomplish a certain task, then we can also be enabled by heaven to accomplish a certain task. So that kind of highlights... Um, another one of the aspects of why that type of thinking is wrong that says, oh, someone else is more qualified. To think someone else is more qualified is actually keeping our eyes on humanity rather than on our Heavenly Family. It's attributing to them the works of our Heavenly Family. Even Christ said that the works that he did were his Father's works. He didn't do things by his own ability. Christ wasn't specially qualified to do his certain task. He only became qualified because of his willingness. And he said that greater work shall we do. So the thought that someone else is more qualified when we as individuals have the promise that we shall do greater works than what Christ did is really just a lack of faith in the promises of God and not viewing God as doing his work or their work and just focusing on men. So, yeah, there's many different aspects to this, but it's so, so important to keep these principles in mind so that we don't end up dishonoring our Heavenly Family by leaving a duty that they've given us to someone else, thinking that, oh, well, they're more qualified, or for any other reason. Hey, Trent. Yeah? I think I have a way to surmise exactly what's wrong with that thinking. The problem with the thinking is that people are thinking, which means that people are taking it upon their own merits and themselves to qualify or disqualify themselves for something that something, somebody else, our Heavenly Family, has already made a better determination because they know better. Excellent. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, I, I guess a way that I would summarize that as well is to just say that they are esteeming their own judgment better than that of heaven's judgment. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously, there's, they know better than we do. So for us to, like, even contemplate whether that's true or not, it's, it's A, unnecessary, and B, it's, I think it's fruitless, too. I mean, it's why fight it? I mean, I know we all fight it, <laughs> but why right. fight it, really? Yeah, it's just setting up our own thoughts in place of their thoughts. Yeah. Good, yeah. All of these are really good, good principles and important principles. Um, I like private interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Very much so. Our own interpretation of how God should do his work and all of that 
it's the same type of thing that uh, Judas was involved in. He had his interpretation of what the Messiah's mission should be like and his interpretation of how the work should move forward. And he didn't accept the way that Christ was doing it. And ultimately, of course, we know where that led, unfortunately. So, in relation to this whole idea of not moving up and down, some other aspects were mentioned in terms of um, Lucifer and his desire to change his position and so on and so forth. Um, and there's some statements that I have from Ellen White along those lines. So if there aren't any other comments before that, then I'll, I'll go ahead and read this, and then, of course, we can discuss the principles more. So if anyone has a comment, let me know. Otherwise, I'll start reading these statements. Okay. Um, so the first statement that I like to read is from Early Writings, page 145. And it's paragraph 2. So bless us, Heavenly Family, as we read these statements. So here in Early Writings, by the way, uh, Ellen White is talking about how, and actually, let me just go so I can see the broader context, but she's talking about the, the fall in heaven prior to the fall on earth. And um, she had spoken before about the hours of worship and different things like that and how it was all peaceful and harmonious. And she's about to address how that changed because of... Um, Lucifer's decision. Okay. Yeah, okay, this is in a section called The Fall of Satan. This is also in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. So I'll actually read paragraph 1 and 2 just because it gives the context. Satan was once an honored angel in heaven next to Christ. His countenance, like those of the other angels, was mild and expressive of happiness. His forehead was high and broad, showing great intelligence. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. But when God said to his son, let us make man in our image. Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to be consulted concerning the formation of man, and because he was not, he was filled with envy, jealousy, and hatred. He desired to receive the highest honors in heaven next to God. Until this time, all heaven had been in order, harmony, and perfect subjection to the government of God. It was the highest sin to rebel against his order and will. I think that itself is an extremely important statement. It was the highest sin to rebel against his order and will. All heaven seemed in commotion. The angels were marshaled in companies, each division with a higher commanding angel at its head. So, of course, this is the same sort of thing we were reading or reading and discussing last night with different divisions of angels and different ranks and so on. So, the angels were marshaled in companies, each division with a higher commanding angel at its head. Satan ambitious to exalt himself and unwilling to submit to the authority of Jesus, was insinuating against the government of God. Some of the angels sympathized with Satan in his rebellion 
and others strongly contended for the honor and wisdom of God in giving authority to his Son. There was contention among the angels. Satan and his sympathizers were striving to reform the government of God. They wished to look into his unsearchable wisdom and ascertain his purpose in exalting Jesus and endowing him with such unlimited power and command. They rebelled against the authority of the Son. All the heavenly host were summoned to appear before the Father to have each case decided. It was there determined that Satan should be expelled from heaven with all the angels who had joined him in the rebellion. Then there was war in heaven. Angels were engaged in the battle. Satan wished to conquer the Son of God and those who were submissive to his will. But the good and true angels prevailed, and Satan, with his followers, was driven from heaven. Okay, really amazing. Makes me want to just keep reading this. It's just such an amazing um, series of events. But it's very interesting to notice how everything was in order. And the way Ellen White described it here is that, hey, plans were being made for the creation of humanity. And Lucifer was not included in those plans. And because of that, he was jealous of Jesus because he was included. And, of course, certain of the uh, aspects of this that Ellen White speaks of elsewhere also help to inform our understanding. For instance, she talks about how Jesus um, wasn't known to be the Son of God, how he was just as the angels. They didn't recognize that he was their creator. So you could see how Lucifer might look at him as more of a peer and, well, why is he, you know, being exalted and I am not? So he became jealous and he wanted the highest honor. And so he wasn't satisfied with his own position. And that's uh, how this whole thing started. And if, it's interesting how Ellen White says, that it is the highest sin to rebel against God's order and his will. So, certainly, I would say that the community rule in saying what it does is certainly in harmony with the principles that Ellen White uh, speaks of here. Hmm. Does anyone have any comments or questions concerning this? Hi, this is Christina. One thing that stood out to me was that the other angels that sympathized with their adversary, um, how they were, you know, left with him. But you would just think for someone sympathizing with another's decision, um, a, the great consequence for that. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, you're basically saying that they're right when you sympathize. I mean, and that's basically taking the same attitude that they have. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what stood out to me because I've never thought of being sympathetic with another person that way when really we're taught just to hate sin just so much. And that yep. was the appropriate reaction rather than to sympathize and take understanding to that person rather than immediately hate it and want to have nothing to do with it. Right. Mm-hmm. That makes me think of in um, what happened with Nadab and Abihu where their relatives were told not to mourn for them because if they would have done that, then that same rebellion would have spread through all Israel 
because it, you know, it would have shown that they felt bad for their consequence rather than their sin. Right. Mm-hmm. That's an excellent um, parallel account. Yeah. Then that's why decided measures have to be, in order to keep the peace, you can't let rebels, just like the man gathering on the Sabbath, he had to be put to death because you can't allow rebellion to get started or it's chaos. you got to deal with it in order to keep heaven heaven. Yeah, and that's amazing too how, you know, in these couple paragraphs that we read, it talks about how, you know, basically there was an investigative judgment for the the angels here where they had to be brought before the Father, and he would decide the cases. Uh, I I think it even says each case. And when it was decided that they had to leave, it says, um, all the heavenly hosts were summoned to appear before the Father to have each case decided. It was there determined that Satan should be expelled from heaven with all the angels who had joined him in the rebellion. Then there was war in heaven. So you can see there how, yeah, I mean, it was definitely seen that this was a very, very serious thing, and it had to be dealt with. It couldn't just be left to remain like that. You know, you have huge contention And then when it was decided that they were to be expelled, it says, then there was war in heaven. That that basically shows how how the war started. I mean, who started the battle? Well, if, if Lucifer and those who were with him decided, okay, yeah, we'll leave. There wouldn't be a battle, you know. But evidently, uh, they refused to leave, and, yeah, things escalated. It's amazing. And, by the way, there is another place, um, I believe it is in Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, where, okay, I thought I'd be able to find it real quick there. Um, I'm going to try one more time here. Okay, I think I found it. It's Mount of Blessing, page 118, paragraph 4. Okay. Could our spiritual vision be quickened? We should see souls bowed under oppression and burdened with grief, pressed as a cart beneath sheaves and ready to die in discouragement. We should see angels flying swiftly to aid these tempted ones who are standing as on the brink of a precipice. The angels from heaven force back the hosts of evil that encompass these souls and guide them to plant their feet on the sure foundation. The battles waging between the two armies are as real as those fought by the armies of this world and on the issue of the spiritual conflict eternal destinies depend. So there's a statement that the battles waging even currently between these two armies are as real as the battles fought by the armies of this world. So I know that this is somewhat of a side note to what we're discussing, but I wanted to mention it because it highlights the seriousness of these principles and how, you know, to take the position toward the community rule, let's say, for advocating 
order, organization, people being satisfied with the position that heaven has given to them, you know, to, to be against the community rule for saying that, is absolutely the spirit of Satan and is the spirit that leads to violence and that uh, really caused this whole war to begin with. So any other comments before we go on to the next quote? And I think it's all because that God gave us freedom of choice. That's why things have to be as they are, because because of our freedom of choice. I'll, I'll say that that's definitely true, but I'll say that another statement that... Um, is almost the reverse, is also true, just in another sense. Um, because of choice, that's why things don't have to be the way they are. Amen. You know? Right. And what I mean by that, of course, is that, yeah, the fact that we have free choice shows that things didn't have to turn out the way that they are. Right now, things things actually could have been very, very different depending on how individuals would choose. Um, But then, of course, there is the reality that because people chose what they have chosen, things are the way they are. Right. They've either got to be brought back or put out. They cannot stay in the community of heaven. When they want, when they want to uh, have their own way, which seems like strictness, but it's the only way heaven can remain heaven. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it just, you know, when we understand the nature of the principles which Lucifer advocated, it just makes sense because even if you know, our heavenly family decided, hey, you know, things don't have to remain heaven. You know, if things don't have to remain the way they are, sure, let's go ahead and change everything. You know, let's abide by these principles. Um, the whole thing would end up self-destructing. You know, it just yeah. can't last. It cannot last when people are exalting themselves. Because imagine this, if Lucifer, you know, he wants to exalt himself, he wants the highest honor, well, if another person lives by his same principle, they will want the highest honor. Well, then how is it decided who's going to have the highest honor? Well, eventually they'll end up fighting over it and killing each other. And, you know, again, it'll, it would result in what it has resulted in. And so, yeah, I'm very, very thankful for the fact that our Heavenly Family was not willing to experiment with trying things the devil's way. Wouldn't it have been easier just to program everybody content and loving, at least on those uh, on those two principles, and then uh, let everything else be chosen? <laughs> right. Well, you know what? I'm honestly not sure if that is even a possibility for multiple reasons. Uh, One thing is I'm not sure if it's possible to limit free will to just those aspects. And then the other thing is that I'm not sure if it's possible to actually have love not be a free will thing, you know, for everyone to be loving means you have to pre-program love into them, and love then is not a choice. And I don't think that it can actually be love then. Um, so, you know, I mean, you could say our Heavenly Family had a couple options. They could either have a bunch of robots or at least partial robots or whatever. And I don't know if this is the right way because I, the right way to express it. You know, people usually use the phrase robot to refer to 
non-free will agents in conversations like this, but hey, maybe robots can have free will. So that's why I'm saying it's not necessarily the best way to put it. But um, yeah, I mean, if they have non-free will agents, I mean, that really could get boring real quick. You know, I mean, you don't really have real individuals, real personalities to deal with. And no one can, even for our Heavenly Family, no one could ever present anything new to them, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm glad that they have chosen to do things the way they have, and I'm glad to have free will. And honestly, I think it's worth the loss and worth the risk. You know, I mean, the loss is awful, but... Ultimately, I do think it is worth it. We have free will, but it's with responsibility. They made us in their image after their likeness. Yeah, it's true. With choice comes responsibility to choose the right. And we could mess it up for ourselves and for many more people. But yeah, ultimately, I do believe of course, that things will be set right. So, um, I guess I'm going to read this next paragraph. Um, this is from Great Controversy, page 495, paragraph 3. This is referring to the same set of circumstances with Lucifer and so on and so forth. God, in his great mercy, bore long with Lucifer. He was not immediately degraded from his exalted station when he first indulged the spirit of discontent, nor even when he began to present his false claims before the loyal angels. Long was he retained in heaven. Again and again, he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. Such efforts as, and actually, sorry, I just have to pause there. Offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. Okay, so here's the thing. Often people think that repentance and submission follow pardon. You know, sometimes people think, oh, we've all been pardoned at the cross. Or Jesus pardons me once I just ask him to pardon me. Well, how unjust would that be to say to Lucifer, hey, look, it's, you can be pardoned, but on condition. You know, first you have to repent and submit. And then, when we come along, say to us, hey, you know, I'm going to pardon you first. You can be pardoned. And then over time, whatever, you can, you know, generally submit one item at a time, but you're pardoned. You're good in my books. You know, that would be really unjust, and that would certainly be an occasion for Lucifer to be able to um, accuse God of being unjust, and he would be accusing rightly if that were the case. So anyways, that's just another side note. Okay, so the general idea is God was long-suffering with Lucifer. He did not immediately cast him out. He didn't remove him from his exalted station, his high position, and so on. He was retained in heaven for a long time and given a long, long uh, series of opportunities and pleadings. So again, again and again, he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. Such efforts as only infinite love and wisdom could devise were made to convince him of his error. The spirit of discontent had never before been known in heaven. Lucifer himself did not at first see whither he was drifting, 
he did not understand the real nature of his feelings. But as his dissatisfaction was proved to be without cause, Lucifer was convinced that he was wrong, that the divine claims were just, and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels. He had not at this time fully cast off his allegiance to God. Though he had forsaken his position as covering cherub, yet if he had been willing to return to God, acknowledging the Creator's wisdom, and satisfied to fill the place appointed him in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. But pride forbade him to submit. He persistently defended his own course, maintaining that he had no need of repentance, and fully committed himself in the great controversy against his maker. So incredible. Again, but notice, discontent and dissatisfaction with his position. Community rule. Again, how does it put it? It says, No man shall move down from his place or move up from his allotted position for according to the holy design, they shall all of them be in a community of truth and virtuous humility, of loving kindness and good intent one towards the other, and they shall all of them be children of the everlasting company. Amen. Trent, Amen. I'm sorry, could you tell me again where that quote was that you was reading about Satan? Was that Great Controversy? Yeah, that's Great Controversy, page... 495, paragraph 3. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any comments or questions on this paragraph? Again, in harmony with truth in my book. Amen. That was the first time rebellion had ever risen up. Never been before, but now that it has, you don't have to ever raise up again because everybody knows what the results of allowing rebellion are. Certainly. I just love how our Heavenly Family pled so long with him. Who knows exactly how long, but it sounds like it was a long time. And that they showed him why, let's see, how does she put it? Okay, so she's just talking about how, um, you know, he was pled with for a long time and so on and so forth. And it says, as his dissatisfaction was proven to be without cause, Lucifer was convinced that he was wrong, that the divine claims were right and so on, or that they were just. It's incredible how, you know, our Heavenly Family, in pleading with him, you know, they didn't just go and tell him, you know, submit. They showed him the evidences of why his discontent was without cause. You know, they, they really sought to have him understand, to help him to really see it, that, hey, no, 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 There's, there really is no cause to be upset or dissatisfied or discontent and they showed him all that they found a way to communicate that to him in a way that he wondered, would understand and he did but in pride he refused to admit that he was wrong and so he just put himself on that course to not admit it and to keep going and uh it's it's just incredible though seeing the dealings of our heavenly family with him. 
Hmm. All right, I'll go on to the next statement now. Uh, this is from letter 86, 1907, and it's paragraph 5. Enmity between truth and falsehood has existed ever since the fall of Satan. The being who now works so constantly to sow the seeds of error once occupied one of the most exalted positions in the heavenly courts, but he was not satisfied with his position. He determined to be more highly exalted, and he worked to further his ambitious projects until there was war in heaven. So that, again, is just so plainly showing that it had to do with his lack of satisfaction with his own position and wanting to be exalted to a higher position. Um, another statement on this is from letter 6, 18, uh, let's see, 1894, paragraph 3. Again, that's letter 6, 1894, paragraph 3. The Lord is acquainted with us individually. Everyone born into the world is given his or her work to do for the purpose of making the world better. And in doing our God-appointed work, we make ourselves better. For in doing the work given us of God, we individually live out the law and the gospel. Each one has his sphere. And if the human agent makes God his counselor, then there will be no working at cross purposes with God. He allots to everyone a place and a work. And if we individually submit ourselves to be worked by the Lord, however confused and tangled life may seem to our eyes, God has a purpose in it all and the human machinery, obedient under the hand of divine wisdom, will accomplish the purposes of God. As in a well-disciplined army, every soldier has his allotted position and is required to act his part in contributing to the strength and perfection of the whole, so the worker for God must do his allotted part in the great work of God. So this, of course, shows the idea of allotted positions and tasks and all the rest of that and how, you know, we have all been given these different skills, these different talents, a different place, a different function, and we should be totally satisfied and happy to do that. Because surely our Heavenly Family chooses for us what we are most suited for, and what will make us most happy. So, yeah, I thought that that statement really uh, brought the principle out very nicely. Are there any uh, comments or questions concerning it? Well, I know for, for me tonight, as I'm listening to these quotes and stuff and this discussion, it really convicts me of some things about myself that I hadn't realized. And so I just praise our Heavenly Family for, you know, the wisdom that they share with us to try to lead us to a higher, a higher plane with them. And, and I just want to say thanks. Amen. Amen. I've always thought that 
Boy, this is really being strict. God is love. Why so strict that it's the only way that, you know, like the ancient church, they didn't want to do it God's way. They kept killing the prophets that God sent to correct them. And the modern day church are doing the same thing. And the same thing's going to happen to them if they don't repent. We've, we've got to have only one God and do do things their way. And we could go a step further with what you just said there, Leroy. The same thing will happen to us. Right. If we don't, um, you know, come into unity as you've brought out tonight. And the only way we can be in unity with our Heavenly Family is if we uh, choose to stop serving sin. Right. And I, I made that choice this morning that I, I don't want to be thinking that this is strict anymore because I see that it's, it's the only way that heaven can be heaven. Amen. Amen. So yeah, there's only sense, one more... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> in a sense, it's kind of like we are um, figuratively killing the prophets if we don't allow the words of the prophet to, um, to you know, actually change us from the inside out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it uh, reminds me, Hod has talked about uh, killing the prophets through neglect. I think you talked about that in the Jezreel letters. They were killing the prophets by not doing what God sent them to tell us to do. Right. We don't want to talk about the 144,000 anymore, but yet that's God's way that he's going to finish the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So there's just one more statement here that I had from Ellen White in regard to these principles. Um, and let's see. Yeah, it's, it's dealing with how this same principle and this same violation of principle was at work in the fall of humanity as was at work in the fall of Lucifer and the rest of the angels who followed him. Um, so this is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 483, paragraph 1. The sin of this age is disregard of God's express commands. The power of influence in a wrong direction is very great. Eve had all that her wants required. There was nothing lacking to make her happy. But intemperate appetite desired the fruit of the only tree that God had withheld. She had no need of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, but she permitted her appetite and curiosity to control her reason. She was perfectly happy in her Eden home by her husband's side. But, like restless modern Eves, she was flattered that there was a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. Mm. But in attempting to climb higher than her original position, she fell far below it. This will most assuredly be the result with the eaves of the present generation if they neglect to cheerfully take up their daily life duties in accordance with God's plan. So, very, very interesting. Um, you know, Lucifer wanted to exalt himself. Eve also wanted to exalt herself to attain to a higher sphere than God had granted her or allotted her. Um, And then Adam, of course, 
he had the aspect of lowering the position that God had given him. You know? So all of those are are at work. All of those different um, violations of this principle. And really, it's, you know, thinking that our own wisdom is better than the wisdom of God because God allotted for us a certain function and role and place in the society of heaven. And it's really the thing that will make us most happy. But then we think, oh no, something else will make us most happy. We really want something else. And we're just wrong when we think like that. Lucifer had everything he needed to make him happy. Amen. Inspiration says there is no excuse for sin. To try to, what's this say, to try to uh, justify it is to, I forget how that quote goes, it is totally unnecessary. Amen. Well, don't know if there's any other comments or questions, uh, but I think that those statements from Ellen White really help to bring out the principle here. So again, in the community rule, I'll read this last section again. No man shall move down from his place nor move up from his allotted position. So you, I'll let you guys respond to this. Is that in harmony with the principles of truth or is it against the principles of truth? In, in harmony case, with them. In harmony. Amen. I, I absolutely harmony. agree with that. Amen. Okay, so now I'll read the next uh, sentence here and we'll ask the same question. For according to the holy design, they shall all of them be in a community of truth and virtuous humility, of loving kindness and good intent one towards the other, and they shall all of them be children of the everlasting company. So what are your thoughts on that? What line is it? I don't have my book with me, so I can find it when I get home. Well, that's in harmony okay. with the scriptures, because we know that we are supposed to esteem others higher than ourselves, and we're to be kind and loving towards them. So um, it would appear as though that is in harmony with God's word. Would you read it again, please? Sure. Uh, and I'll say amen to that, Rebecca, and also for Leroy, I'll mention that it is uh, 1QS column 2 around line 25. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is what it says. And actually, I'll read it with the, the sentence prior to it as well, because this last sentence is actually explaining the reason. It starts out with saying for or because. No man shall move down from his place or move up from his allotted position. For, according to the holy design, they shall all of them be in a community of truth and virtuous humility, of loving kindness and good intent one towards the other. And they shall all of them be children of the everlasting company. I think the key point in there is according to the holy design. Well, one of the key points. It's all, there's several aspects of it that are very, very important. But one of the things here that um, is standing out to me is that the reason no one shall move down or up from his allotted, allotted position is because that's the holy design. That sounds like phenomenal programming. <laughs> Absolutely. 
And one of the things that stands out to me here is that by it saying no one shall move up or down because, et cetera, et cetera, they shall be a community of truth and virtuous humility, well, that implies that to seek to move up and down from your allotted position is not practicing virtuous humility. You know, it's, it's practicing self-seeking and pride, and it's not good intent towards one another or loving kindness. It violates all of those principles. So, when it's saying that we should not move down and not move up from our allotted positions, it's really just saying that that is putting in practice, or that is at least part of putting in practice, virtuous humility, truth, loving kindness, good intent towards one another. It's all part of that, and that is all part of the holy design. The holy design is built upon those principles. Amen. One thing that jumped out at me is um, tying that to the everlasting covenant. So if we're willing to submit to these principles and partake of that mindset, then we will um, receive the everlasting covenant. We'll, We'll actually enter into it, which of course is being born again. Amen. Well, that just goes in line with the principle of that if you are, uh, you show yourself to be content and responsible with the small things, much greater things will be added to you. Mm-hmm. So prove yourself with the small things. You know, whatever position it may be, doesn't matter. The bigger things will be added to you. Amen. Yeah. For allowing God to be God instead of trying to be God ourselves. He made us. He knows what's best for us. <laughs> Got to trust him. Amen. And a couple of these statements that people have mentioned brings to mind some uh, some things that Ellen White has to say particularly to women and wives and mothers, but to everyone, but it was commonly in the context of speaking to women. And what she would say is, um, you know, a lot of times people tend to think in order to work for God, they have to, like, go off somewhere uh, and do some great grand work, like potentially a a missionary to another country um, around the globe or, you know, whatever the case may be. Preaching to lots of people. Mm Mm-hmm. And what Ellen would say, what she was writing is explaining, you know, even your normal household duties are doing the work of God. And if you're doing them cheerfully and you're doing them well, then you are doing the work that God has given you to do. Do that work first. You know, don't feel like you're not doing anything. Do whatever you have to do and do it cheerfully and do it well and then you may be called to do something bigger or different or whatever. And uh, even just, well, I'll say in the past year or two, with everything that we have to do and, you know, various people um, all over the place expanding into various countries and whatnot that 
are in contact with us, and we, you know, just having the burden of knowing how many people are out there that need to be reached with this message, there are times when the devil tries to, to make me feel like, oh, I'm not doing enough. I, I don't have time for, you know, cleaning the house or whatnot, you know, the more menial tasks, doing laundry. Oh, I don't have time for this. There's more important things to do. And it's like, no. Even these tasks are doing the work of our Heavenly Family, and they're important to do. Like, just think, if I were to um, decide I'm not doing any more dishes because it takes me away from editing or something like that. That would just be crazy. And so as we're talking about this section in the community rule, and not uh, wanting to move up or move down from your lot of position and how the holy design is that everyone in the community, uh, they'll all be in a community of truth, virtuous humility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just reminding me how everything that we do, so long as we are... Um, so, so long as it's what our Heavenly Family has given us to do, and so long as we are doing it to the best of our ability, then we, uh, we're right where we should be. And not to want to change our position, even if it's, for a quote-unquote good reason or a, a noble purpose. And um, that has just really helped me in maintaining a balance in the work. Amen. Were there any other comments on this paragraph? in connection with the quotes that we read and all of that? Okay. Well, uh, we've been on now for a while, and we've gone through a decent section, and uh, to get into something else, we would be going into the next paragraph, so I think that that's probably best kept for next time. So would anyone like to um, have the privilege of talking to our Heavenly Family to close us off? I will. Awesome. Oh, dear Heavenly Family, thank you so much for meeting with us. Thank you for this appointed time during which you are pleading with us stop sinning and to accept your mind, the mind of Christ. And Heavenly Family, it's, it's just such a privilege to be in, in this group and be offered this everlasting covenant. We love you so much and thank you so much. And I just ask that you would be with each one of us, send angels to us, help us to um, receive these truths into our minds and have them to work, do their work in us that you designed for them to do so that we can rise up out of the dust a mighty army ready to harvest the world. And we thank you so much and ask all these things in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Amen. Have a good night. Love you all. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.